Welcome. We're here on the day four of the Rebels tour and we're with Kenneth Adams, the founder of Adams Drafting. And Mr. Adams is on a mission to bring lawyers and contract drafters away from an archaic world of legalese and into a more standard English age of contract writing. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Mr. Adams, my first question for you today is why should lawyers care about adopting a standard of contract writing? Well, traditionally lawyers have drafted contracts by copying either a template or using a contract from another deal. And that has an appealing economy and simplicity to it. However, um, the one result of, of endless copying is that people have lost track of the, the efficiency of the language they're using. Uh, the result is that mainstream contract language is actually something of a soup of, uh, of archaic and redundant provisions and all sorts of uh, other inefficiencies that make it uh, result in one taking more time to draft a contract than one should and it also makes it a lot harder for the reader. The result is that you lose a lot of time and as a result uh, your companies the world over are also losing or uh, lost lots of money that uh, they needn't spend on the process. Furthermore you have um, the fact that inefficient language can result in their being buried in any given contract, some sort of problem that will blow up after closing. Uh, there are any number of examples of uh, protracted litigation that had at their root some ostensibly modest drafting glitch. Ken, to give our viewers an example, of the types of changes you'd like to see law firms implement, why don't we take a look at a contract that was drafted by Latham and Watkins and Wilson Sonsini and see ways that that contract could have been made more effective. Yes, I'll, I'll just add that uh, the contract in question uh, relates to Oracle's acquisition of Sun Microsystems. It dates from last April and it was indeed uh, the product of the work of two firms Latham and Watkins and Wilson Sonsini, but I hasten to add that um, the firms, the identity of, fir of the firms involved is irrelevant because that contract is entirely representative of mainstream contract drafting. Here's the front of the contract where you want to set the scene for the reader quickly and efficiently. Let's see how good a job they did. The title is Agreement and Plan of Merger. I'd omit and plan of merger. Sure, Delaware's merger provisions use the term plan of merger, but the Delaware Secretary of State's office will tell you that you don't have to call your merger agreement that. Here's the introductory clause. First, why use all capital letters here? It's not a title, so use all lowercase letters. The introductory clause should be a regular sentence. This one isn't. It needs the pointing word this at the front and it needs a verb I'd say is dated. The defined term this agreement is pointless. I use the full agreement reference at the beginning of the introductory clause and elsewhere say this agreement with a small a. It's simpler and easier to read and isn't susceptible to confusion. As of is a casual professional courtesy that's used so inconsistently that I don't bother with it. The lead-in to the contract says that the parties are agreeing to what follows. Amazingly enough, this contract has two lead-ins. This one here, and this one here. I'd omit this one. Note whereas used to introduce each recital. It's archaic. The recitals themselves are very wordy. And I wouldn't bother with the first one regarding authorization, as that's dealt with in the representations in the merger agreement, and it's not something the reader needs to know up front. This lead-in contains a traditional recital of consideration of the sort that's in 99% of all business contracts, but it's really archaic, and as a matter of contract law, it's useless. I could go on, but instead let's look at the body of the contract, which contains the substantive provisions. Here, selected at random, is that part of the termination provisions that says when the parent company can terminate. 
Like most contracts, this one drastically overuses shall, as in shall have occurred. The result is strangely awkward and confusing prose. Instead, use shall to mean only has a duty to, and otherwise use standard English. We have willfully and materially breached here, but just material breach here. Why the inconsistency? And don't use willful or willfully because it's unclear whether willful means intentional or malicious. That confusion could easily lead to a lawsuit. And anyway, what does material breach mean? The word material is ambiguous, so in one part of a contract, material breach might be used to mean any non-trivial breach, whereas elsewhere it might be used to mean a deal-breaker level breach. I'd want to avoid that kind of confusion. Notice the phrase representation and warranty. It's universally used, but as a matter of law and semantics, it's pointless and confusing. This provision refers to what happens if any representations shall have become inaccurate. But a representation is either accurate or inaccurate. It can't become inaccurate. Similarly, representations aren't curable. If they're inaccurate, they remain inaccurate. Those are important misconceptions. This whole proviso is rather awkward and ends with something that seems not to make sense. The proviso says, in effect, that if a problem can be fixed, the parent won't be allowed to terminate until after 30 days or the company stops trying to fix the problem, whichever is earlier, provided that, and here's the bit that seems odd, the company continues to try to fix the problem. That last bit appears to be redundant and is probably a leftover from an earlier version. And how successful have you been in making inroads in changing the way contracts are drafted within law firms and in-house corporations? Uh, the answer would have to be a mixed one. Um, my book, A Manual Style for Contract Drafting, has happily been selling like hotcakes, and I know that, uh, that uh, all sorts of legal organizations throughout the land have a copy and consult it uh, happily. Uh, on the other hand, change at the level of the individual is going to be a slow process of winning over one lawyer at a time. Ultimately, I think the most effective change is going to be at the level of the organization because that's where we can implement more sustained and comprehensive change. Uh, I'd like to see contract uh, drafting ultimately be a, an automated task using document assembly. In fact, I'd like to see um, much of contract drafting outsourced to an authoritative vendor of uh, document assembly templates so lawyers can focus on the tasks where they add the most value, namely, uh, namely helping devise strategy and assisting in negotiations. But that's my utopian view of, of where we want to be, um, and uh, we're working towards it. So we're making progress, but uh, we have ways to go.